Hi and welcome to this video. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jan Hendrik Meyer and in this video, or let me better say, in these two videos, I would like to go into data structures in R. Let me show you what I planned for this video. In this first video, I would like to go into variables, vectors and matrices. So after some preliminary thoughts, I would like to discuss with you how we should name variables. Variables are simply a place to store data in, just like my shelf here. And of course, I can give this shelf a certain name and how should we name this storage place where we put the data? That's the question here. Then we further go into variables and of course we have to differentiate um, a few a few types of variables and we get to know some functions how to handle them. Then we are going to combine data to vectors using the C command. C stands for combine. What is a vector? A vector is like several shelves underneath each other where we can put data in. And of course we are going to combine matrices. And what is a matrix? A matrix is just like this IKEA shelf which has several dimensions. We're going to apply the matrix command here. In the second video I'm going to go into data structures again but then we get to know the data frames. And we're going to import data from CSV files and Excel files. CSV files are comma separated values, which is more or less a text file. And Excel files, you will all know them. And we're going to do some data handling with that data. So in video number two, we're going to combine data frames using the data frame command. We are importing the data and we are accessing the vectors within the data frame. I will just show you in a few moments what I mean if I say access the vectors within the data frame. And we're going to go into indexing, slicing and filtering, but more on that in the second video. To make this better understandable, I have just prepared a little overview that I would like to show you now. Now, here's my overview. First of all, I would like to differentiate what kind of data we would like to store. I would like to differentiate into numeric data, which means numbers, into characters like text, and into logical data. Logical data means only true or false. So. I can always answer something like 4 equals 4 with the answer true. Or I can answer 4 equals 5 with the answer no, it doesn't equal. Accordingly, logical expressions like true and false, and indeed there is a third one, which is NA, not valid or not available. Um, so these three uh, expressions can be stored in a logical data structure. Now, let us have an example with the variables. Variables always store only one item. So here, a variable underscore num var num, it's just a name, right? It's just the name for my first cupboard here. And uh, I, can, I can choose which name ever I would like. And in this variable, which is called variable underscore num, I assign or I store the number 15. Assigning always uh, means an R with this arrow always pointing to the left. So the variable name is always on the left, left never on the right. So the arrow always points leftwards. Um, and I store the 15 in there. Later on in R, we are going to make this arrow using a smaller than and a minus. And we have 
a variable character, var underscore chr. And we store some text into it. So here, my first name, Jan, is stored into that variable. The computer knows that Jan is the text because I use uh, quotation marks. If you're from the US or from other English-speaking countries, you might prefer the high comma, which is completely equivalent here, so you can use the high comma too. Um, uh, but here in continental Europe, of course, we prefer the uh, quotation marks. A logical value can also be assigned to a logical variable. So var underscore lcl may be a name for a logical variable, and I assign, I assign the word or the expression true to this variable. Well, this is one value for each variable, but we can also have multidimensional um, data structures. Multidimensional data structures is we can put more than one value, like two, three, or hundreds of data um, items into those data structures. And accordingly, we have to differentiate into non varietal um, structures and into varietal structures. Varietal structures are varietal. They only have numeric or character or logical data in, but never mixed. Never mixed. Um, Non-varietal structures can be mixed. So the basis is the so-called list. I assign a list here, or I make a list here, lst underscore data, and I put a list of items like 15, Jake, and true into it. To make sure that you understand that this is a list, I use um, the, the, um, uh, the brackets like these. These are... I use these square brackets here uh, to make sure that you understand that I mean that this is a list. Uh, nevertheless, lists are rarely used in R. Probably you come to a point where you can apply them. I just want to show you that they are existing. On the opposite, we see vectors, and vectors are variable. They are all of the same kind. So I can have a numeric vector here, storing a number of numbers, like 10, 15, and 20. 10, 15, and 20. Or I can make a character vector, like Jan, Sam, and Eve, and I can put them into a vector. I can store them in there. Or, of course, a logical vector, like true, false, or NA. Now, obviously, a vector has one dimension. We can also apply two-dimensional structures. And so we come to matrices that are variable. A matrix can be numeric, a matrix can be character, or a matrix can be logical. Of course. Will we use matrices a lot? Well, honestly speaking, not. So what is really important here? Really important are, of course, the variables. Very, very, very important are the vectors. Sometimes, quite rarely, we will use lists, and sometimes we will use matrices. What we will use a lot but this is for the next video, is a data frame. A data frame is a structure that is mainly like an Excel table. It is made of vectors. So each and every column has a vector, but these vectors must not necessarily be variable. So the vector inside must be variable. 
among the vectors, they must not be variables. So here we see a character uh, vector, here we see a, num a numeric vector, here we see a character vector again, numeric and a logical vector. So the vector itself must be variable. Among the vectors, they can be quite different. Well, we go into data frames in the next video, but they are the workhorse of every statistical analysis, of every data science analysis. And sooner or later, we will definitely have to apply data frames to our data. We now switch into our studio and let's have a look how all that works out. Well, I've just arrived in our studio and I open up a new script window. Now, here's my new script window, so I can start from scratch. And let's give it a headline first. So, this is some of the knowledge that I give you on the fly. We are making headlines with at least five hashtag signs. So, we're talking about basic um, data structures. And this is video number one. And I also end those headlines with at least five hashtags. What happens now? Um, using five hashtags will give me this little drop-down arrow and I can fold in the whole code until the ne next headline shows up. I will show you later on what that means. And now I put another headline in and let me have some preliminary thoughts. Okay, some preliminary thoughts. What you've already learned is what a function is. And let me just repeat this. So, this is a function. By the way, as you see, I just used one um, hashtag here, and this is a comment. And you don't see this folding drop-down menu here. This is just um, a command that I put in. So, using these, you can structure perfectly your code. Now, you, you already learned the print command, and the print command indeed is a function. And a function has a function name, which is print, and a function always has round brackets. The round brackets are used to hand over data or to hand over attributes to this function that the function needs to do something for you, to perform some calculations or to do whatever. Without any data, I just run it, but I run into an error now. As you see, there's no argument. So we need a certain argument here. Uh, we can give some data into it. So using quotation marks, that's data, that's character data. And if I hand over character data to the print function, to the print command, um, well, the computer now knows that uh, I want to print hello world. And indeed, there we see the result. And we also learned about assigning a variable. Oh, one too much S. Assigning a variable. And we give it some name, just like variable. And I can put some data in, just like numeric data. And as you see, I assign with the smaller than and the minus. And accordingly, um, this variable now shows up in my environment. There's the variable with the name variable. And it is it stores the value 5. Well... As you see, that was not a good idea, wasn't it? Because the uh, to name a variable, variable does not really, really make sense. So let us talk about variable names. Uh, 
And of course, uh, the first rule for variable names is the variable name should express what is stored in the variable. And of course, a variable name that is called variable doesn't do that, right? So, um, what can we do here? As a uh, like number of cigarettes, right? The number of cigarettes in a package could be 20, and I store this. So, this seemingly uh, expresses a lot better um, what I mean, what is stored in this in this variable. Uh, and I can print this variable and I get back the value 20 because 20 was stored in this variable. Well, um, okay, the next rule would be Rule number two, variable names should differ from commands, from command name or function names. And of course, if possible, they should not be close to it or similar either. Because if someone reads your code and he does not, he or she does not understand if this is a variable or a function or a command, uh, this might confuse persons. Nevertheless, um, if we take a look, we already know that a function or a command always has brackets, while a variable does not. Nevertheless, uh, this can confuse uh, people, so uh, let's, keep some, let's keep some distance in, in our wording. And rule number three, Rule number th three is to use camel case, lower camel case, dot separation, or underscore separation. What does that mean? Let me make those examples. So our first example we already had number of cigarettes and that was 20 this is called camel case why is it called camel case because we mix uppercase and lowercase letters just like camel and that's why it's called camel case um, and since it starts with an uppercase letter this is uppercase camel case or but not lower camel case uh, number cigarettes this of course starts with a lower case n so this is lower camel case we can also use number uh, dot cigarettes and have 40 in there, which of course is dot separated, or number of cigarettes. Let's uh, assign 50, which is underscore. Now, what is better here? It's, it's a discussion, to be honest. So, the point 
is available. So there are some commands, there are some functions that are point separated too. That's a big problem. But there are also commands and functions that are underscore separated too. Still a problem. So if we look into other programming languages like Python, uh, the dot would be completely prohibited uh, because the dot there has something to do with, um, with object-oriented programming. Um, since we don't do object-oriented programming, um, it's not a big problem here. Nevertheless, we still are in the problem that we are not, uh, we can't rule out number rule number two here. So what I recommend, what I recommend is to put the data structure that we are using in front. So like var data and let's assign some value just like 100 and here's my variable. Um, if I put in front var and underscore or var or dot, um, you al already see, oh, this is a variable. This cannot be a command. And this is very, very nice and very well differentiatable with functions and commands. So this is what I recommend. Of course, for other data structures like vectors, I would use VEC for matrices, MAT for data frames, DF, and so on and so forth, so that I cannot forget what kind of data structure this is. Well, now my next headline is one, two, three, four, five variables. One, two, three, four, five. And now we have a try. We want to fold in variable names and it is gone. And I can unfold it again and fold it. So let's forget about variable names. We are now talking about variables. And the preliminary thoughts, I can fold it away. So let's talk about that and we don't get confused from all the other code. So, variables. We would like to differentiate into numeric variables, into character variables, and into logical variables. Now, we already know numeric variables, so let's assign a numeric variable. Variable A should now be the number five. I assign this and just print it. Print variable A. And I get the result five. Of course, since I stored five in it. What I can do now is to apply the class command. The class command is to check what kind of variable is this class variable a and I get the result it's a numeric variable. Those of you, and this is to be honest some background knowledge, those of you who come from other programming languages like Python know that, that there is um, a differentiation between integers and floating point numerics. What I see here is a floating point the difference between integers and floating point variables is the storage in the memory of the computer so this is really hard tech knowledge that I give to you um, nevertheless so this is a floating point because if I apply the is integer command is it an integer I will receive false no it is not an integer although 5 of course is an integer if I give 5.5 5, of course it's not an integer it's floating point it has some decimals after the comma uh, but we get the same result here so let's include a little code that has some integers. 
I just use again the code, but I don't use the A, I use the B now. And I add to the number five an uppercase L. Let me run this one. So I have stored, and you see this in my environment, uh, the five with the uppercase L, which means this is really an integer. I print it, I get five. The class is now integer and not numeric anymore. And the answer to is integer is true. So I can reuse my headline again here. And this is an integer. So some background information on that too. So typically calculations with integer often lead to integer values like addition, subtraction, or multiplication. But division often does not lead to any integer. And if I now apply is.integer like 5L divided by 5L, we all know 5 divided by 5 will give 1, which is integer. Nevertheless, the result of this calculation, anything divided by something, is always a floating point. So this is some tech knowledge that you should keep in mind if you apply integers. Nevertheless, nevertheless most calculations in R are based on numeric variables. Integers are rarely used. So um, you, have, you have heard of that. You know what the L means. It's integer. Nevertheless, it is rarely used. Let's go into character variables. And of course, I can apply the same code here. But it should not be variable A, but variable C. And let's give it, let's give it, of course, we need quotation marks here. And I just enter my name here. I want to print this variable and I get back these, uh, this text. And I want to see the class, and this is new now, and of course it's character, because it's a character variable. Now let's go into the logical variables. Variable D now stores some true. And let's go through that. We're now storing the word true. Oh, the expression true. We are printing it and we're getting back true. And we get the class logical. Now, uh, this is very important for us later on because data handling is very much based on logical variables. And of course, we can also do calculations on that. Because internally, R understands true to be equal 1, false to be equal 0. Let's check that. Uh, I just now print variable D, and I multiply variable D with 1. So, if it would be a character, this would lead to an error. But if R now understands that true is 1, 1 times 1 will equal 1, and indeed we get the 1. I can also switch this to false. If false understand as being 0, of course this line will lead to a 0. And, fun fact here, um, the logical expression true and false is accompanied with the third one, that is NA. 
not valid or not available number, not available data here. So each time any calculation leads to an NA, each following calculation will also lead to an NA. We can do this very simple. I just assign an A to this. I print it. The class is still logical. But if I now make this calculation, the result is an A, because each consecutive uh, calculation based on an NA will again be an A. Well, that's about variables here. So, just a brief repetition. We have three types of variables. We have numeric variables where we can differentiate a little into floating point and integer, but we don't need to go into depth with that. We have character variables and we have logical variables that can only store true, false, or an A. Well, and we have um, learned how to assign variables, we have learned how to print variables, and we have to learn how to check the class of a variable. And if it comes to logical variables, we have learned um, that logical variables also represent a value, because true represents one, and false represents zero, and this is really important in our data science because later on we call this a dummy variable. And a dummy variable is always one and zero coded like male and female or like good weather, bad weather or is it Monday or not, something like that. And we can put all that into very complex statistical models later on. So this is really, really important. So variables are quite are uh, a bit boring, to be honest. Um, I love doing multidimensional data, data uh, structures, so let us go into uh, multidimensional data structures here. One, two, three, four, five, multidimensional data structures. And I'm going to hide all that we learned now about variables. So multidimensional data structures is our next topic. And the first thing we would like to do, again, one, two, three, four, five, is combining lists with the list, no, the list command. One, two, three, four, five. Again. Lists do not play the biggest role in R. Nevertheless, you should see what it is. So LST is a list. I call this list number A because we only have one. And we now combine a list using the list command. And well, I can put in hello. I can put in 155. And I can put in true. So that's my list. I just want to print the list. And I get back. It looks a bit curious, to be honest. Hello, 155 and true. So this is a non-variable data structure. I can put it put in any garbage. Fun fact here, I can make a list of lists. A list of lists, of course, is a very much multidimensional data structure. And it, it has not only one dimension like a vector, it can has multi, 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 multi dimensions. And we call this a tensor. A tensor has more dimensions than a matrix. So we can put lists into lists into lists into lists. Really ridiculous. So let's have fun. Let's do that. Uh, so list A, but I, I just make a bit, a bit more variable here, 100, 155, and 200, and let's copy it, copy, so we have list B, and we have list C, and I just increment them all a little, so that we can differentiate that's all.
Okay, and now I make the list of list. I call it list L, list of lists. And again, I apply the list command and I list list A, list B, and list C. Oh, it's all in there. Let's print that. There it is. Now we have a list of lists. Here's list number one, and we already see that in those double squared brackets, we see the one here, and here we see one element of one, and it is 100. And here we see the second element of the outer list, and here we see the third element of the outer list, and here we see third element of the outer list, first element of the inner list. Whew, that's complicated, isn't it? Can we now access one of the items in there? That would be very interesting, right? I would like to read out, let's say, 157. Of course I can. Let's print list L. And I now use those brackets. I need a double outer bracket. And I want to go into the third item of the outer list. And another double bracket. Now I go into the inner list and I want to have... Is it the second? Yes, it's the second. And I just print this. And as we see, I got back 157. And it comes from here. It's the third element of the outer list and thereof the second element of the inner list. So, lists give a very good overview about multidimensional data structures. And they can even have higher dimensions than only two dimensions. They can also be three, four, or five dimensional, and this is what we call a tensor. Um, well, this is some background knowledge on multidimensional data structures. And now, of course, we want to come into those data structures that are really of importance to us. And the first thing is a vector, of course. And I just hide all that stuff. Let's talk about vectors. And of course, we have numeric vectors. Well, the, the real headline should be combining vectors. With the C command and C stands for combine. So I have to combine a vector. I now call it vec and my first vector should be vector A. And I combine this vector using the C command and I just want to put some numbers in. 100, 150, 200. Let's run this. Let's print it. Well, I didn't run it. No, I didn't. I, uh, I didn't even assign that. What's that? There it is. Um, 100, 150, and 200. So I have just printed the vector with its three elements here. I can also apply the class command because I want to know if it's a numeric vector. And indeed, it's a numeric vector here. Character vectors. Let's copy some code. Whoa, what happens? And uh, let's see, I just stored or assigned Jan, Sam, and Eve using the combine command and put that into the vector B. 
Let's print it. Jan, Sam and Eve. All three elements. And I get back that this is a character vector. And of course, last but not least, we have logical vectors. Extremely important for data, data handling in video number two. So vector C will be true, false, and an A. Let's print that. Whoop. I forgot a C. Or There's the C missing, and now it works out. And of course, I want to check the class vector C, and we see it's a logical vector. Okay, so vectors extremely important for our analysis later on. We're not going to calculate a lot with vectors. Nevertheless, we can do calculations based on vectors, just like we can on variables, just like we can on matrices. And it's really helpful to understand that, although we don't use it in our everyday life. Well, okay, that's about vectors. Let's go to matrices. And we want to combine Combining matrices with the matrix command. And I move away again the vectors so that we have a clean window and we can combine some matrices. First of all, I would like to make this matrix out of vectors. That's pretty easy and pretty straightforward. So I just reassign vector A and give it some 1, 2, 3. Vector B, I know that I already assigned them. I just overwrite them 4, 5, 6. And vector C, just like uh, 7, 8, 9. Okay, that's it, I have them. And now, um, my first idea was, could we simply make a vector of vectors? Like that list in list idea, that doesn't perfectly work. Nevertheless, I would like to show you what happens. So our vector, I call it X now, will be a vector of vectors. I combine vector a with vector B with vector C. And since I already used the abbreviation vector, you see that it's not a matrix coming out here. I just run this command and I print vector X. Oh, I didn't run all those numbers. There it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So if we combine those vectors, it is simply putting the vectors underneath each other, and they all will be stored in one large vector. Nevertheless, we can use this, and we can um, apply this, making a matrix out of this. And now let's define matrix X. And our matrix X now uh, should be combined using the matrix. Um, command. And of course, I just put in vector X in here that I have combined before, right? So all this I put in here, vector X. This is my idea now. And I give it the end call which means number of and call, which means number of columns, and it should have three columns. Let me run this and let me print this. Uh, matrix underscore X. And there it is. We now have vector number one in the first column here, vector number two in the second column here, 
and vector number three in the third column here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So, a beautiful technique, first combining a vector of vectors and then putting all that into a matrix. We can also do this, and I call this matrix epsilon. We can also do this uh, row-wise. I apply vec vector x again. I give it the uh, attribute n row is 3, so not number of columns 3, but number of rows 3. And I uh, also need to uh, hand over by row like uh, is true, by row is true, um, so that the matrix command now will stitch or compose this matrix row by row. And I do this print matrix epsilon, and there it is. Now the first row is our first vector, 1, 2, one, two 3. The second row, 4, 5, 6, is our second vector, and the third vector, 7, 8, 9, is the last. Just one little he hint, and then I come to the end. Um, we can um, transpose matrices using the T command, which stands for transpose, and I can transpose matrix epsilon, and I get the transposed matrix. Of course, again, it's better style to use the print command uh, for outputting the transposed matrix, and here it is. So, thank you for watching this video, and don't forget to watch video number two on data structures. There we will learn how to handle data frames and how to import large Excel tables that we can use for our data analysis. Bye-bye. Thank you. And instead of goodbye, how about so long?